Welcome back to the Fox Den, everyone, a podcast series from West Shore Community College. We are reviewing the winter 2023 book of the semester, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. This episode covers chapters one through six, where we chat about the book's biology, chemistry, and physics with your West Shore professors. Hi, I'm Wade James, professor of mathematics, and I think middle school science teachers are rock stars. Hi, I'm Joger Husky, professor of math and science, but I don't think I'd like to go to space. Hi, I'm Sonia Seward, chemistry and geology. Couldn't really figure out how to get much geology in here except for melting some glaciers. Hi, I'm Paul Belinsky, professor of biology, and I think bacteria are pretty neat. In chapter one, our protagonist, Ryland Grace, awakes in an unfamiliar room with tubes attached to his body and a nanny bot supervising his behavior. A flashback reveals Ryland lives in San Francisco and is investigating a thin red line of infrared light extending from Venus to the sun, known as the Petrova line. In chapter two, Ryland concludes he is aboard a spacecraft along with two deceased crewmates. Flashbacks reveal the red Petrova line is composed of microscopic extraterrestrial life, which are consuming the sun. In chapter three, Ryland gains access to additional sections of the ship, which is called the Hail Mary. As memories continue to surface, Ryland recalls the name of the microscopic alien life, astrophage, astro for star and phage for to eat. Chapter four continues the series of flashbacks where Ryland recalls details about his deceased crewmates and discovers that astrophage have a number of unique characteristics. It becomes clear to Ryland that Project Hail Mary is a mission to study these astrophage and return information to Earth by four unmanned probes called the Beatles. Flashbacks continue to reveal more information about astrophage and the international effort to organize Project Hail Mary. In chapter six, Ryland fuses the past with present, finally comprehending his mission is to travel to the star Tau Ceti, which is unaffected by astrophage. Upon learning why Tau Ceti is immune, Ryland will send the antidote back to Earth to save the solar system. Paul, as a professor of biology, what was the one thing in the sections that we looked at, the chapter one through six, that you really geeked out about? Yeah, so there are definitely two things that really caught my attention in this this part of the book, which had a lot of really cool biology to dive into. One that I'll talk about really briefly about water and then something really cool with the, the meat of it about interstellar travel and humans. So about water and living organisms. Why is water so important to life? Well, beyond being the liquid, water is something that can move substances around very effectively while also being a currency for building and breaking down macromolecules. We use water in order to build and break down all of the proteins, DNA, lipids, and carbohydrates that make us up. So every time your body is needing to build a protein or digest a protein from the burger you ate, water is exchanged. Every time your cells copy your DNA to grow a new cell from healing a wound, water is also needed. This is such a fundamental feature of water. So in the book, they ask, could life exist without water as the basis of this exchange? Well, as I dove deeper into this topic, I found that actually maybe there are some substitutes, something like ammonia that would have similar properties as a liquid, as well as being a currency that could exchange in the building and breaking down of whatever macromolecules are building up this other form of life. And while we haven't found evidence of it yet, I was super surprised that there have actually been legitimate ideas proposed within the scientific community for using something other than water as the backbone of life. But I think the juiciest topic in this part of the book for me is how humans could survive interstellar travel. The book obviously begins with that medically induced coma. And actually, as it turns out, that's not something that would work because medically induced comas cause damage over the long term and they fail to maintain homeostasis. But there is a way in which humans could perform interstellar travel. We'd need to perform something called torpor, which you may better know as a form of hibernation. And this is such a real thing that it's something actively being investigated by NASA, which I had no idea. The goal of hibernation, absent interstellar travel, is to survive a time of scarcity through a reduction 
in the amount of energy an organism is spending by lowering its metabolic rate while keeping all of the tissues and cells intact. Hibernation lowers body temperature significantly while also reducing your heart rate and your breathing rate. With some animals on this planet, having their hearts only beat a few times a minute. So while Grace only wakes up at the end of his journey, this would not be the case with hibernation because hibernation requires periodic arousal. You need to wake up from your hibernative state in order for your body to maintain homeostasis. Another super important reason for arousal from the hibernation, and this actually like stunned me when I read about it, was that hibernation is not restful sleep. Because in order to actually sleep restfully, you'd have to have your regular body temperature or close to it. And hibernation drops that body temperature. I just could not believe that hibernation's actually not sleeping. Organisms need to wake up, like bears wake up from hibernation in order to get some restful sleep. I want to connect this as to, to why the body temperature reduction is so important. When temperatures drop, our metabolic rate drops because at a cellular level, molecules move slower, meaning that your proteins are less likely to bump into the sugars that they're trying to break down or the DNAs they're trying to copy. So lower temperatures help tremendously in reducing our metabolism. We want to keep things frozen without actually having the damage that occurs in real freezing because real freezing would cause crystals to form in your cells and shatter everything. Not going to work for us. So we can imagine hibernation as being functionally frozen on a cellular level because we have certain genes that have told our cellular machinery to stop everything. This leads to the next idea that, that continued me down this rabbit hole, wherein grace would have something that uh, these other scientists or other humans would not, a gene that allows him to survive hibernation better. We could imagine that this gene would antagonize all of our metabolic processes, telling them to slow down. But instead of a coma resistance gene, as mentioned in the book, Grace could have inherited something called a transcription factor, which we talk about in my bio classes, that acts as a master regulator. This form of hibernation or torpor is actually something that's fairly ancestral to us, because all animals have to deal with times of scarcity, and hibernation helps you do just that. It's found everywhere on the tree of life, and therefore it's something that's likely currently or was buried somewhere in our genome, meaning that there's a chance that we also inherit this same gene in a functional form. It could be turned off in us or methylated, for those of you who have taken bio two with me before, but under stressful conditions, we could unmethylate that gene and turn it back on. So this thread that's talked about throughout the book about grace being special actually has some veracity to it, which I didn't expect to find. Now, if you appreciated this foray into hibernation, uh, please do keep an eye out because all of this research was done with a group of students who are putting together a pretty rad presentation that's a deep dive into the biology of hibernation. It's been a blast to work with them and I'm super proud of their final product. I got a question for you, Paul. What about when you were starting to talk about when a bean goes into hibernation, do they still go through the regular brain cycles of deep sleep and REM sleep? Or do they stay in one sleep cycle mode? They're not even in a sleep cycle. They're in a like stalled out form of consciousness, which is even scary to think about, right? Imagine yeah. you're there hibernating and then all of a sudden you're, you're, you really can't move your body, but something's coming to get you. And, and it, it's, it's just this weird non-restful state where you do have to wake up in order to do that like spinal fluid wash of your brain that keeps it healthy, right? Like that's ultimately why we as human beings need sleep because sleep allows us to wash all of the things that accumulate in our brain. We feel fresher in the morning. That that doesn't occur during hibernation. So it's literally hibernation, is its goal is just to save energy and freeze things metabolically, slow all of our processes down wait out whatever unfavorable conditions exist, and then get back to the real living afterwards. Paul, in, in any of the reading that you did, I mean, were they trying to put humans in some type of torpor or were they not really to that stage yet? They've studied different cases where humans could go by, like they have one really neat example um, in starvation times where humans would wake up to eat a piece of bread and then go back to sleep. So they'd essentially be completely conserving their energy for 
23 and a half hours a day, eat a very little bit and survive for months like this. Yeah. It's it's not something that we're at the genetic engineering level for, but there's a lot of really cool discussion around how to make something like this possible in our species. One of the things that's been talked about, freezing your brain or freezing your body. So when we are able to save people from diseases that we currently don't know yet, do you think that's even possible? A lot of that is where my skepticism kind of first arose about around freezing, because anytime you freeze a tissue, I have a lot of experience with this from my microscopy. When you freeze a tissue, you shred it. I, I don't know how, uh, and obviously this is something that some folks are looking at, but I don't know how we really come back from something like that. Um, so I, I think the the if if you were to, if I was to bet as to which of these would be the most likely route for us to do interstellar travel, hibernation most likely. Perhaps if we can find a way to to have robots do a lot of our bodily function, a medically induced coma, second most likely, and then third would be that that cryopreservation. I, I really think hibernation uh, is something that that could potentially be realistic. So, Joe, what did you find to be the most feasible part of this section of the book with regard to physics? Right out of the gates, when they're in the ship, Ryland has this feeling of wrongness. He feels confused. Of course, he's kind of coming out of uh, whatever kind of state he's in. It seems like something beyond that. There's something unusual about his environment. He decides to test the acceleration due to gravity with a tape measure next to the bed. The book talks a little bit about uh, mechanisms of artificial gravity and testing gravity. So I was kind of um, you know, interested in the, the, the types of things that I talk about in class in terms of specifically how we sense weight. Like to a human, what does weight feel like? And also how can we simulate that, that feeling of weight in terms of the, the weight and what weight actually feels like, I've got to take one of you guys on a little thought experiment. Anyone willing to go on a thought experiment with me here? One one of us is definitely going to survive. Okay. I have a feeling <laughs> I won't, but. Okay. So we've got, so we've got just a couple of elevators on campus. I'm going to escort you to the elevator. You're going to get in the elevator. I've got these bolt cutters in my hand and I'm going to climb up on top of the elevator and I've handed you this apple and you're going to hold that apple in front of your head. And when something significant happens, I ask you to just drop the apple. So of course I've disengaged the safety mechanisms. I'm going to snap that cable and that elevator car is going down. We're up on the second floor. So your sensation would be that you're weightless. Like you would have this feeling that you're weightless. You drop that apple and what's the apple going to do right in front of you? To you, it's going to look like it's going to kind of float right in front of your face, you know, because it is dropping. But who else is dropping? You're dropping. The elevator car is dropping. Everything's dropping. But you have this sensation that you're weightless when in fact, weight is the only thing you've got. From like a Newtonian kind of perspective, weight is all you're experiencing, but that apparently isn't what we feel. When you only have weight, that's the thing you feel like you don't have. It turns out that, you know, your body has a number of different uh, cues, a number of different mechanisms that it uses to sense motion. And one of them is actually like the nerves inside your body that normally your organs are kind of like sitting and resting on one another. And then all of a sudden, when they're not, because that elevator car is dropping, that tells your brain that something is awry because that's an unusual situation to be in. Your organs are no longer sitting on each other like they were. It turns out that what you usually associate with a sense of weight is something that is keeping you from falling. Like if you're sitting in a chair, that sense of the chair pushing up on you, that's what we think of as weight. Or when you're standing on the ground, it's that contact from the ground pushing up on us that we think of as weight. When you step on a bathroom scale, it isn't directly measuring your weight. It is measuring how hard the ground has to push up on you to keep you from falling. So what we experience as weight is really just not falling. He tested the free fall acceleration and he found that the free fall acceleration was like 15 meters per second per second, which means that that thing would 
pick up speed at a rate of 15 meters per second for every second that is falling. When on earth, it should only be like 9.8. I often use 10 in my classes because it's close enough, you know? So that's a little bit higher than he expected. And then he goes through his like uh, kind of astronomy knowledge and says, well, there's no planets in our solar system that should have a free fall acceleration like that. So he's trying to come up with explanations for why that could be. He suspects that something else could be causing this perception of weight. He thinks that he might be on a centrifuge. If you're in a centrifuge, uh, it would turn out that you would have different amounts of acceleration depending on how far from the center you are. The farther out from the center, you're going to get more acceleration because you're kind of whipping around faster if you're at the perimeter of a larger circle. And of course, if you're in closer to the center, it doesn't accelerate quite as much. So Ryland, he tries his little, his pendulum trick, which is just how much time it takes for a pendulum to swing back and forth. So he tries it at different locations in his habitat, and he finds that he has the same free fall acceleration everywhere. So he suspects that he's not in a in a centrifuge. So he has to come up with some other explanations. The next explanation is going to require another thought experiment. Who's going to go on the next thought experiment with me? I'll go. In this next thought experiment, um, I'm going to have to escort you, Paul, to this pine box that's going to be about seven feet tall and maybe tapered a little bit at the sides. And you're going to get in the pine box and we have to tack you in there and we have to seal it up real tight at the edges. And there's this hook at the top and you're just standing in this pine box, you know, and it's dark. You can't really see a whole lot and everything feels ordinary. The ground is pushing up on you. You feel like you have your weight, but all of a sudden you feel like your weight has increased. You feel much, much heavier, like you're pulled down to the bottom. And of course, what's happened is that I'm in this spaceship and I've hitched on to that hook that's on the top of the pine box here and I'm lifting off away from the planet, you know, I'm lifting away. So I'm picking up speed and it's that picking up speed that is forcing that ground, the bottom to push up on your feet even harder, which to you feels like additional weight. So that if I just kept going out of the earth's atmosphere and I was like pulling you at a, at a, at an acceleration of one G or our 9.8 meters per second squared, if I was pulling you at that rate to you, it would feel like you're standing on earth. The fact that you're being pulled at that acceleration would be completely indistinguishable from weight. That is actually something called Einstein's equivalence principle, that weight is indistinguishable to our senses from acceleration. So of course, Ryland ultimately finds out that, or he perceives that he's in a spaceship and it's accelerating. He figures out how to like read the controls on the ship and he finds out that his speed is decreasing. And he calculates that rate at which the speed is decreasing and it's 1.5 Gs. So it explains where his supposed weight is coming from. The ship is slowing down and uh, he realizes, of course, that he's in the pine box. Could you talk about his pendulum a little bit and why and how you can use a pendulum to determine the acceleration due to gravity? The rate at which a pendulum is going to complete swings depends only on the length of the pendulum. The other factor that the, um, the time to swing requires is the, the gravitational field. Is. So if you took a pendulum to the moon, where the free fall acceleration is one sixth of what it is here. If you guys were to go to the moon, your weight would be one sixth of what it is right now. So you could divide your weight by six and that's how heavy you would feel. That's how much the ground would have to push up on you in order to support your weight. So the pendulum, the only two factors that affect how long it takes to swing back and forth are gravity and the length of the pendulum. So if I'm in a playground, and there's a child on a swing and an adult on a swing, yeah. yep. but that swing has the same length. length. Yep. They will swing back and forth in the same amount of time, regardless of their masses, as well as regardless of how far back each one is pulled. They would still have the same swing time. Yep. Yep. That's about right. Sonia, let's jump to you. What did you geek out the most about with this book with regard to chemistry? The main thing that I really geeked out about is my background being in spectroscopy, the role of electromagnetic radiation. One of the big things is this Petrova line and what they were examining with this 
along with Rylan Grace, you know, in the role of science, just logically working out solutions according to the scientific method. What Joe was just speaking about, you know, trying to figure out where am I? Am I on planet Earth or am I not? Am I on a spaceship? How all of that comes together. And the big thing that was noticed by Dr. Arena Petrova, this astronomical phenomena, the Petrova line. What does the IR spectrum actually mean? It's actually less energy than the visible spectrum. Um, IR spectrum is 780 nanometers to one millimeter. The reason it's important, longer wavelength means it has less energy. Here in the chemistry lab, we have an IR spectroscope. Different molecules absorb infrared light at different wavelengths and causes different bonds to vibrate carbon bonds or water bonds. And so once again, as Paul started at the beginning, water is crucial. Joe, do you have anything to add? The listeners would be alarmed to discover that they themselves are just showering infrared radiation out all the time. Anything that's at like an ordinary kind of roomish temperature, plus or minus a bit, is just giving off tons of infrared. I've got one of the little cameras in the lab here if anyone wants to see themselves. Oh, you do? You got a FLIR camera in the lab? Yeah. Yep. I might have to stop down sometime and check yeah. it out. Yeah, we'll show the students themselves and I can see if their drinks are hot or cold. We can see, well, that's an external door. That's a that's his internal. You can tell a big difference in the temperatures. Yeah, Sonia, what did you think when they were talking about the astrophage migrating from the sun to Venus and being able to pick up on the carbon dioxide in Venus and the hydrogen? I would assume it's hydrogen. Maybe they're picking up helium as well from the sun. Like what, what's the difference in those spectral lines? And are there any other entities that we know of that see in infrared? Well, the sun, our sun would be definitely the hydrogen and the helium. Um, the carbon dioxide, yes, we use spectroscopy. Just talked about this in our general chemistry last semester on they emit different wavelengths. It is a fundamental fingerprint for our different elements on where they absorb energy and emit energy. So that is definitely one of the ways we can actually tell there's carbon dioxide on Venus or not. I don't know if they've been able to do spectral lines on exoplanets. I don't know if we have oh, yeah. enough light. They, they, can't, do we? they can't always. They can sometimes, um, if, if the planet has a good size atmosphere, just as it passes in front of its star, its atmosphere can 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 function as a filter to filter the star's light just a little bit, but only when it's like just getting right at the edge. This idea that every element has its own spectral line that serves as a fingerprint, if you can collect that light, that electromagnetic radiation, and then match the spectral lines of that light to the spectral lines of elements, you can identify the composition, the elemental composition of what you're looking at, which okay. seems pretty cool. Yep, that's Absolutely. very important in and They use that in astronomy. We use it in criminology to identify what metals are present in a shell or of a bullet. So it's applied in so many places. Was there anything in these chapters that you were kind of like, eh, I'm not so sure about that? We find out that the organism stores energy directly as mass, like according to our most famous equation in physics, our E equals MC squared. Humans have technology to convert some small proportion of mass into energy, and that's how like a nuclear power plant works. But like directly 100% mass to energy or energy to mass, that's a little far-fetched. I mean, it's hard yeah, to imagine. Especially it, for like a biological system. That's to right. Be able to yeah. do, like a system Absolutely. that contains water to be able to do that type of energy conversion. And if it did, it would either be, it would either need, need to feed specifically on gamma rays and not infrared, or it would be showering gamma rays off like crazy because that's the type of electromagnetic energy that would be in the kind of nuclear and particle transition domain. Yeah. Do you think that's something that the author had to consider that 
in order for us to detect this, we had to make yeah. the, the power source of the engine an EM radiation that would not kill us, right? So like if these, yeah. Yeah. if astrophage emitted gamma radiation, then that that'd probably be kind of bad. Yep. I, I bet you're right. Yeah. And actually, I, I mean, I, I can find a lot of little things to nitpick about like the causality for our relativity explanation, but I think we can only <laughs> do that because the science is actually pretty decent. Like there's a, there's a lot of good things in the book science wise. There's little things that have to be bent, but that's science fiction. I mean, you naturally have to adjust things a little bit. So, I mean, as like, we're all super trained and we can kind of find these, these subtle little issues, but it's actually pretty strong in terms of the amount of research that he's done and how thought out things are. Did you guys have any favorite quotes or pop culture references or maybe inside jokes that only a chemist would get or maybe that only a physics person or a biologist would understand? Uh, something that really kind of resonated with you. I am a big Beatles fan, so I did like the little, I mean, they talked about him being at the end of his long and winding road, you know, so little things like that I picked up on. And and what is that reference, Long and Winding Road? That's a Beatles song. Well, mine, once again, really for the first six chapters of the book, related to the Beatles and naming them after the band members in the Beatles. My favorite was when Rylan was in the lab and he punctured the the membrane of the astrophage and it, and it ripped apart. And Strat came in and sort of criticized them about, we can't help but kill things like predators or something like that. And there was a comment made that actually in the first Predator movie, the human did not kill the Predator. The Predator killed itself by lighting up a bomb. It wasn't until Predator 2 that humans killed the Predator. And I thought... There's somebody that's done their research. I have not really a pop culture reference, but certainly something that resonates with me as a biologist. It's simply the naming of astrophage, right? Like literally star eater. I can't think of the number of times I'm talking about something in biology that has some really obscure name, uh, like pleiotropy or epistasis. And all our biology terms are, are just in another language saying, saying the obvious, right? Like uh, epistasis on top of and controlling, astrophage, star eater. We, we just take and have these terms that sound confusing, but once you understand the you know history of language, really biology just tries to name things as obviously as possible. So I thought that was pretty like on point as far as biology would go in terms of naming uh, an organism. I'm gonna put you on the spot. How about Tau Ceti? What is that? That's mean? a star. That's a that's an astronomer thing. I we don't name the stars. They ain't living. Actually, that it does go back even further. So I can get it in your domain. It's actually named for the cetaceans, the marine mammals. Do you know why cetaceans are named SETI? It's whale in the sky. Whales, the, yeah. Uh, why are they yeah. named cetaceans? I I don't know that. I don't know either. That's a weird one. Like pachyderms, you know. Something from chapter four that maybe one of you knew the reference that I don't. Um, when he Rylan Grace is back in his classroom, he says, this just leads to a bunch of drama because children are animals, horrible, horrible animals. I think sometimes middle school aged children react to sarcasm differently than adults react to sarcasm. He's establishing sort of a rapport with his students in that he can use that type of language and they do not take offense to it. They they think it's it's okay. They don't right. They, they kind of laugh about it. And the fact that he has uh, bean bags as reward systems in his classroom, you know, he does a lot of pedagogically sound things in his classroom to get students excited about science. I looked up the cetacean bit, and it's actually after the Greek god Ketos, a sea monster. So it's they are literally sure. named for being sea monsters. So that that okay. again something to another language mythology back in the day and yeah. I certainly could imagine a killer whale being a sea monster because no thank you don't put me in the water next to that. So what would the tau that, mean? That probably would be the which star it is. They usually in a constellation Alpha will be the brightest star. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet in that constellation. The second brightest star will be Beta, Seti, Gamma, Seti, Delta, Seti. On down the line, Tau is probably like the 15th. In the same way, when biology labels chromosomes, uh, chromosome one is your biggest chromosome. Chromosome two is your second mm -hmm. biggest chromosome. Yeah. This, this like 
hierarchical naming scheme. I didn't, I didn't think that it applied anywhere else, but uh, of course it does, right? <laughs> yep. You've been listening to The Fox Den, a podcast series from West Shore Community College. This has been our review of the first six chapters of Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Join us in two weeks for our review of chapters 7 through 12. Until then, I'm Wade James. And I'm Joger Husky. And I'm Sonia Seward. And I'm Paul Belinsky. Rylan recalls the name of the microscopic blah, 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 blah. Hibernation. Oh, dude, that is really awesome. Yep, yep, that's about right.